first letter of Paul to Timothy. As we begin a new sermon series. From the fourth chapter, verses 11 and following. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone let down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in it. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a problem that I do not have. For out of all the things which folks have called me over the years, only a few of which have been scriptural salutations, no one has ever called me a baby face. On the other hand, I married a woman who has always looked much younger than her years, So much so that in my first church, a rumor began around town that someone had seen the Methodist preacher kissing a teenager on the church lawn. I had to stand up in church, say, first of all, it was on the parsonage lawn, not the church lawn. Second, the woman was my wife. And third, we're the same age. We were both 24 at the time. But then as the years have gone by, taking most of my hair with them, this perceived gap in our ages has only gotten worse. I'm sure that some people today really wonder why such a young woman as Julie hangs around an old guy like me. But then I have a feeling that no one ever accused St. Paul of being a baby face either. What Paul was, however, was an incredible mentor to many people, to Titus, to Simon, and to a young man named Timothy. And fortunately for us, as we'll be looking at in the coming weeks, Paul left behind two of his letters to that neophyte preacher, Timothy, both full of life lessons that can speak to all of us, no matter how old or how young we may be. Just a few verses before the ones we read, for instance, St. Paul told his protege to have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, but rather to train himself, literally to gymnazi, we get our words gym, gymnastics from that Greek, to gymnazize himself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, Paul said, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And it strikes me that if the good apostle were here this morning, that he would probably say much the same thing to you and to me. Even within the church today, we have fallen for all kinds of untruths, overlook the trustworthy sayings that actually matter. We've looked to the culture, for instance, um, drawing from its collective wisdom, rather than putting our hope into the living God, who is the Savior of all, especially those who believe, as verse 10 of this chapter so intriguingly puts it. We've even swallowed the rather ridiculous notion that truth need not be absolute or universal anymore, only relative to you and to me. (laughs) That's just plain silly, isn't it? Putting personal preferences aside, clearly at least some truths are meant for everyone. Gravity, for instance, would seem to be an equal opportunity adversary of anyone or anything that tries to rise up above it without eventually falling back down. You only have to believe in it 
All you have to do is hold something out, a microphone maybe, and drop it, and you'll see it come to pass every time. Likewise, the notion that moral truths are somehow less absolute than physical ones is also pretty silly. In fact, it's just plain wrong. Not just wrong for me, but wrong. Wrong all the time, everywhere, for everyone. Godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come, so Paul said. That's why he told Timothy to not only train himself to be godly, but to point out and teach such things to other people as well. Now, Paul knew that some folks might have a hard time taking Timothy seriously. Because whether he was a, a baby face or not, Timothy was apparently the kind of person whom others could never quite accept as having actually grown up. Uh, the Greek word used here for Timothy, Neoniskos, generally described a man from his mid-twenties to his thirties. But Timothy's problem stemmed from the fact <laughs> that he was one of the very first church kids who ever came down the pike. He had been a part of the early church since he was a baby because the church met in his home in Ephesus. And everybody knew Tim as Eunice's kid, as Lois's grandson. In turn, I have a feeling that, as is often the case with many folks, uh, Timothy never really had a dramatic conversion experience in his life, such as what we know is what happened to St. Paul himself on the road to Damascus when he was blinded. Raised in a Christian home, I suspect Timothy came to the faith like many of us do. <laughs> he kind of oozed into it. Timothy was a Methodist. <laughs> Not necessarily a dramatic conversion, just grown up in it. Surrounded by others who believe from his earliest years, it's only natural that Timothy came to embrace those same values and core beliefs at an early age, long before he had an occasion to stumble and fall into the excesses of more obvious sin. Timothy may have been in the very first confirmation class ever offered. All that was good, except for one thing. Some people had trouble taking Timothy seriously. And so St. Paul, knowing this, writes to his young colleague, and he said simply, let no one despise your youth, but be an example. An example of the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Eugene Peterson paraphrases these verses this way. He says, don't let anyone let down on you, put you down because you're young, but teach believers with your life by word, by demeanor, by love, by faith, by integrity. Stay at your post reading scripture, giving counsel, teaching. That special gift of ministry you were given when the leaders of the church laid hands on you and prayed for you, keep that dusted off and in use. Cultivate these things. Immerse yourself in them. Keep a firm grasp on both your character and your teaching, and the people will all see you mature before their eyes as both you and those who hear you will experience salvation. Dear friends, I believe this little piece of advice given to Timothy might be applicable to you and me this morning too. No matter how young, no matter how old, we may happen to be. See, whether we know it or not, whether we accept it or not, all of us were being watched this morning, not by the NSA, hopefully, but watched and carefully studied by other people who are looking to see whether our profession of faith means anything at all when it comes to how we live out our lives. They're looking for a demonstration of what we might call synchronized faith and living. That's why the words of St. Paul here are appropriate ones. Paul says we ought to be an example to others in our words and in our demeanor, our manner of life. That means, among other things, that we learn to be sparing in our criticism of others, charitable in our comments about them, 
encouraging in our conversations with them, consistent in our consciousness that everything we say ultimately goes right back to God who will either be glorified or dishonored by the way in which we live out our lives. And that's a simple idea, isn't it? But it's amazingly difficult to carry out for a lot of folks. How often have we said things that we knew we shouldn't say? Words which may have hurt or misrepresented the truth or were just plain lies. If we want to train ourselves in godliness, that's one of the first things that we have to, have to learn, I think. But likewise, we're told to be an example in love and in faith. In love and in faith. And those two things really say it all about the Christian gospel, don't they? We had a wonderful concert here Thursday night with Amy Grant and Ellie Holcomb. And something, and, and something Amy Grant said was so good, I thought. She said, we don't have to fix other people. We just have to love them. It's true, isn't it? St. Paul tells the Galatians in the fifth chapter, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That means we have a faith which is vital. It comes out in the intimate and personal relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. As we talked about in our confirmation class, Christianity is not a doctrine. It's not primarily even a religion. It is first and foremost a relationship between ourselves and the living God. A relationship which then produces a godly lifestyle or a way of living that daily practices the presence of that God. Be an example, therefore, of faith and love, said St. Paul. Just as you teach these by your words and by your actions. But teach them as well, so the great apostle said, by your purity and your integrity. I don't know if there's any other word that is more relevant to young Christians this morning. This challenge, and it really is a challenge, to stand out for Christ in your purity. See, I, 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 am, I am saddened by this. But you all now live in a virtual sea of impurity. You're surrounded by it. It's come to be such a nature for this culture. So much so that it's hard not to let it slip over into our lives. We live in a culture that doesn't even recognize impurity for what it is at times. But as someone so long ago wisely said, it's not enough for the gardener to love the flowers. They must also hate the weeds, right? My dear young friends, just as there is greatness in godliness, there is power in purity. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon a person to cleanse our hearts, um, when he comes upon us, to fill our lives, he also brings with him that power. It is the power to resist temptation. It is the power to stand up and be counted. It is the power to do the right thing, whatever the circumstances may be. And sometimes it is precisely the difficulty of our circumstances, the presence of them, that gives us the chance to, to develop purity in our lives. G.K. Chesterton once said in this regard, he believed in getting into hot water at times because he thought it could keep us clean. <laughs> be an example thus to others in purity. Because in an impure world, Nothing, nothing will speak so clearly as to the power to be free as the power of purity exercised in your integrity. See, this morning I'm here to tell you that no matter what your age may be, whether you are standing like our confirmation class on the front rows this morning on the threshold of adulthood, because confirmation is that, or you've long since passed that marker, and now you can see the shadows of the next life ahead. Whether you feel old or just look it, <laughs> or whether you have a baby face and others don't take you seriously, this word to the young is a word to all of us. 
irrespective of what the calendar or the years may say. See, this is a word about the power to look forward in life, not just backwards. It's about the power to envision the future, not just wander around in the past. It's the power to believe that the best days of our lives, of your life and your life and your life and your life and yours and of my life and of this church's life, the best days are ahead of us, not behind us. It's the power to plant trees and gardens, believing that someone, if not yourself, will one day be around to enjoy them. In a few moments, we're going to invite each of you sitting on the front rows to come forward and make your own profession of faith, to declare just who the God of your life is, to confirm that you are ready to take Paul's challenge to be an example to other people seriously. And then we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit will fall upon each of you this morning to give you that power to resist temptation and to model purity to others. For the past several months, you should know a lot of people, a lot of people have been praying for each of you. Your parents have been praying for each of you since the day you were born. Sometimes they've prayed harder than at other times. And you know when those times were. We've asked God, we've asked God to bring you to this very place today. And after spending three months with you, the pastors think you're ready. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Don't let anyone put you down because of your age or your infirmity or your handicap or your intelligence or lack thereof. We believe in these words from 1 Timothy 4.12 so much that that's the name of our student ministries program. 4.12. 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone let down on you because you are young. Instead, Paul said, be an example in word, in manner of life, in love, in faith.